Well, good morning. People are starting to join us. I am super excited about this. Wow, what a time, like a very on-time group. Right as soon as we went live, a few people started joining us on Zoom. So I'm excited about that. Very time, like well done group. Good morning, everybody. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to see all these faces. Uh, I'm checking in on Facebook. It looks like some people are starting to join us live there. Uh, so uh, with the new format, we'll do some introductions. We'll do some chit chat from now until about eight. And then at eight, we'll kick it over to Nikita, let her introduce herself. And then we'll start with our questions. So as we're doing introductions, be thinking about work-life balance, what that means to you, uh, what you hope to get out of that. But also, I'm really curious about burnout. Uh, I have some little mental gymnastics that I'm always playing to like keep me motivated. So I'm wondering if I'm like everything I'm doing is actually set up for failure or setting me up for success. Uh, so with that said, I'm just going to go right down my list. Good morning, Annie. If you want to unmute yourself, tell us who you are and what you're looking forward to this spring. No April Fools. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I work for uh, Measurement social impact consulting. Um, I'm really excited to, to hear about life work balance. We talk about it a lot. Um, and looking forward this spring to just getting outside more. Wonderful. Okay, next on my list. Thank you, Annie. It's so good to see you this morning. Next on my list is my good buddy, Don Snyder. Don, go ahead, introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about what you're looking forward to this spring. Maybe. It looks like he might still be connecting. Don, raise your hand if you're on. No? All right, we're going to skip Don. We're going to go to Hope. Hope, good morning. You can unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you're hoping to do this spring or what you're looking forward to this spring. I'm looking forward to getting my second shot. <laughs> Yay! And, uh, and being able to go somewhere and not be worried all the time uh maybe getting over to see my granddaughter and and uh give her a hug for the first time in a year so mainly awesome. back out of the house it'd be great <laughs> yes awesome well thank you for joining us this morning hope uh don we're gonna double back to you we're gonna give you another shot do you want to tell us who you are a little bit about yourself and what you're looking forward to this spring yeah all right can you hear me this time yes Okay, awesome. Hey, uh, Don Snyder here. Uh, I am currently a student coming out of the finance industry and going into data science uh, and business analysis. This spring, I'm looking forward to catching up with all of the friends who I haven't spent enough time with over the last year. Awesome. That is great. Uh, put me on the list, Don. Although I'm trying to put you to work next week. Uh, I have some projects and I'm hoping to recruit Don. Okay, uh, next on my list for introductions. Good morning, June. If you wanna tell us just who you are, who you're with and what you're looking forward to this spring, that would be great. Oh, Don, uh, you're muted, June. So you'll have to unmute yourself. Unfortunately, I can only ask you yeah. to unmute yourself. There you go. Hi. Uh, and hi, everyone. I'm the co-founder of OrganicNearby.com, which is a, an advertising channel for small farmers, small retail farmers to list their products and their farms. You can find all the fresh, local, and organic food on OrganicNearby.com. And we launched two months ago, and we're bootstrapping. Wonderful. And what are you looking forward to this spring, June, other than the launch of your new app? Um, I'm looking forward to a balanced life. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, next up on my list, it's kind of skipping around. So I'm going to try to get to every, hopefully, if I forget you, just raise your hand. Uh, Katrina Rogers. Good morning, Katrina. How are you? I'm well, Josh, and yourself? I'm good, thank you. That's good. Hey, I'm Katrina Rogers, and I'm committed to helping people change the world using astute solutions to speed medical innovations from the bench to the bedside. 
And I, spring is the season of renewal. I am looking towards growth and change. My spouse was playing Sam Cooke this morning. It's been a long time coming, but the change is going to do me good. Yay. Oh, I was just chatting this. You are well coached, my friend. You led with your mission. You were on. That was probably the best introduction I've heard in a while. Okay. Uh, Mr. Odegaard, you're up next, my good friend. How are you? Uh, doing all right. It's going to be hard to match Katrina's enthusiasm. <laughs> She's had plenty of coffee this morning, I think. Yeah, I guess. Uh, Mark Odegaard, uh, social impact consultant. Uh, we arrived work with Annie Whisk Miller uh, at Measurement, and we help businesses improve their social impact and environmental impact. And thanks for having me, Josh. Yes, Mark. Uh, I'm so glad to see your face. Thank you for coming today. All right. Uh, my other good friend, Mr. Rowley, good morning. Tell us about yourself and what you're looking forward to this spring. Well, good morning, uh, Josh. Uh, Rob Rowley, your local uh, death and dirt attorney. So uh, I love uh, spring. I love getting out. Um, you know, it, it is a good uh, season for renewal. I mean, we've all been kind of locked up and I think everybody just done and ready to move on. So uh, I got my shot from my wife and I scheduled for the end of April. So life's good. Take Yay. It. All right. And uh, before we get to Nikita so far, Sarah, good morning. You are next up. Hey, good morning, everyone. So my name is Sarah. I actually moved to Spokane in June. So I moved here during the pandemic. So I'm definitely most excited to actually get to see the city and meet people and explore it because it's been a strange time to move to a new area. <laughs> um, but I work out here for New York Life and Nightlife Securities. So I help individuals and small businesses with just education on finances and helping make sure that they have financial security in all areas of retirement, investing and whatnot. And I really love working with um, just anyone. And I've really been focused on meeting people in the community right now. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. I'm so glad to see you again. Um, how, you got a puppy, didn't you? I did. How's I got your... a puppy in December. Oh my God. So I have like kids in the background. Is your puppy in the background? Are we going to get to hear the puppy at some point? Uh, hopefully not. Hopefully he doesn't bark and I don't get any packages. Let me see if I can get him to come here real quick. Oh, yay for puppy time. This is Finn. <gasps> oh my goodness. <laughs> he is the best little office assistant. Um, I rescued him in December from Adams County Pet Rescue. So. Oh, well, that's awesome. You're a good human for doing that. Okay. Last but not least, uh, good morning, Nikita. We already said our good mornings, but I am so excited to have you here. And just really quick, I was introduced to Nikita through Katrina. They were on a clubhouse in March together. They were co-hosting with another host mm -hmm. and her enthusiasm just caught me. And I, I wanted whatever she wanted to talk about. I said, you can come talk to us about whatever. <laughs> Uh, we had our first meeting last week, and I was actually trying to get her signed up for maybe May, maybe later in the year. And she said, I'm open actually next next Thursday, April 1st, if you're and I was like, yes, please help me. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Nikita. You're all the way from Philadelphia. Tell us about yourself, and then we'll get going. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. A big, big heart love shout out to Katrina. Katrina knows that I love her. We circle in other circles together. So I'm very excited. And because of her, I got to meet you. So thanks for reaching out, Josh. I do appreciate that. It is very, very, very rare for me to be available for anything in less than six months. So you had perfect timing. Uh, my name is Nikita Rin Thigpen. I'm the CEO and owner of a global uh, personal development company that works with power couples and married women entrepreneurs. As a balanced sexology and relationship expert, everything that I do is really to help them not just have wild success in the boardroom, but also in the bedroom. So we do all things intimacy, all things setting and communicating balance and boundaries and dealing with inner conflict and having fantastic mind-blowing sex. So we do talk about everything. Balance is definitely my jam. So we're in good, good company today. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. And before we jump in, I'll set the ground rules as always. So if you're joining us on Facebook Live, use the comments there. I'll be monitoring, monitoring them and pass them along to the group. Uh, also, if you're on Facebook Live, feel free to use the comment section to introduce yourself. Uh, the last time we did this in March, uh, quite a few people introduced themselves and I was able to read those to the rest of the group on Zoom. And then here on Zoom, you're more than welcome to raise your hand, uh, use the chat to ask questions. I know there's going to be a ton. So before we dig in, Nikita, what I would love to get from the expert is let's start with uh, setting the terms. Give mm -hmm. us your definition of work-life balance. What does that mean to you? And how do you work with people on that? Yeah, so what I first do with everyone is I explain what work-life balance is not. It is not that 70-30 that we hear that, you know, we have that legal picture of the, the scales, the laws of justice, and people think that balance has to be 50-50, which is why a lot of people are anti the word balance. They're like, oh, it's no such thing. There's no relationship that's 50-50, and you're right. There's no job that allows you to be 50-50, and you're right. You bring your whole self to everything that you do, although some of us are better at wearing masks of overcommitment and overwhelm and perfectionism and analysis paralysis a little bit better than others, you still bring your whole self to whatever it is that you're doing in the world. So I've kind of defined work-life balance as a formula. It is T over B. So take you back to third grade a little bit when we had to do fractions, second grade, third grade nowadays, I can't keep up with this new age math, how they're doing it now. And if you have little people, you know it has changed tremendously. But old school math with a regular regular basic fraction, we say it's admitting the truth, that's the T, of what you really truly want in your life, like who you want to become, over the boundaries that you're going to create so you can achieve that truth as your reality. Those boundaries have to be expansive enough to keep distractions out. They're not just about a bunch of no's, although no is a huge part of what you're going to need to do when you're creating boundaries because you want truly to make opportunity to say no, so you have room for the yes. So an example of that, if I say that I'm gonna be a mogul in the making, if that's my truth, if my truth is I wanna be a mogul, some secret philanthropist that has libraries that are not in my name, so no one knows that I donated them to a local hospital or whatever the case is, if that's what I really say is my truth, then my boundaries have to be set up in my day-to-day -day behavior to allow me to achieve that. So when my home girl, my sister, my favorite cousin calls me and invites me to her third divorce party, I have to make a decision of whether or not I have space to go to that. Like, is that in alignment with where I'm going or do I need to send her a gift and ask to take her to lunch at a time that's a little bit more convenient than setting myself up for this four hour event that I'm really not interested in being in. So you do have to be really, really honest with yourself. And that's where we get into the nitty gritty. But the basic answer to your question is it's just admitting the truth of what you want and creating some boundaries so you can achieve it. So whether you have five spinning plates in your hand or 50, if they're in alignment with what you are wanting to do, what you're needing to do to become who you really, truly want to be, you don't feel out of whack and you will not get burned out. What I, I hear you saying, which is so great among so many of the things that you said is that if, if I feel like I wanna be a, a, a business owner, a solopreneur, whatever the case may be, and mm -hmm. I want that reality to feel like my extracurricular activities, that's okay. So if yeah. I wanna work Monday through Thursday so I can have three day weekends forever and I want that day job you know, to fuel that lifestyle, you're giving us permission to say that that's okay in Absolutely. what in your terms of work-life balance oh Absolutely. my gosh i love yeah. that i hope that's as freeing to everybody as that was to me when i realized that in my own world uh, although i still struggle with a little bit of guilt okay so now can you give us the definition of burnout and what you mean when you say that yeah burnout for me is really simple because i i experienced burnout before. I come from hospital systems, court systems, crisis centers. A little context and background is I'm a licensed clinical social worker who specializes in trauma. That's the root of what I did for over 20 years before I became an entrepreneur 10 years ago. My business started in 2011. I started wrong. I failed a lot. I wasn't always failing forward. I was failing, failing, and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And a lot of the burnout that was being created that I thought I was escaping coming from the hospital systems and the justice systems and all that that I was dealing with, stakeholders and mayors and all of that, I thought I was leaving that and creating my own new world 
but I did it not connected to who I really wanted to be. I was still living to other people's expectations. A lot of our burnout comes from people pleasing, compensating for guilt or shame, or trying to prove yourself to someone else. It's not always to yourself. Sometimes it is. Sometimes you're trying to prove to your inner 15 year old or 17 year old that was maybe bullied or told by the cool kid that you would never become or you would never be, you know, and there's no judgment there. Sometimes we are trying to prove to our older unhealed self, but many times some outside external person or pattern, right? Because those patterns that we live and, and drive to convinced us that we weren't worthy of having something. So we do all these scattered things to have a bunch of busy work on our plate to make us feel like we're being productive when it's actually the opposite of what we're doing. That doesn't mean that you can't really have a full day of high level productive work to do and get burned out like you're in an audit or you know, creating an RFP or just really in a zone. Those moments are gonna come, but they should be the exception, not the rule. If they're the rule, it's because you are people pleasing, compensating, or trying to prove yourself to something that really isn't serving you anymore. Oh my gosh, there's too much that like we could just spend the rest <laughs> of the time talking about all the things that you just talked about. And I don't want to like ping pong around too much, but you said some hot button words for me that have really impacted like my journey as a business owner, my wife, who's super supportive and help, helpful. Um, and works in the business with me, but you talked about guilt and shame yeah. as definitions of burnout. So what you're saying is it's not just about, I, I've worked you know, six months without a break. You're saying there's emotional burnout that can happen even if you've taken enough breaks and it's the result of like this people pleasing guilt and shame. But talk to me about what you see people experience when it comes to guilt and shame in, in their work life areas. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, whether you have little humans that came from your body or that you're raising, adopting, nurturing, the neighbor's kids, you're the best auntie or uncle in the world, those humans count and add to some of the guilt and shame you have. As well as if you're a pet parent and you feel like, oh, I've worked so long, I, I barely made it home to take you know, my favorite puggle to go to the bathroom twice a day, whatever the case is. There's mm -hmm. lots of things that make us feel burdened with not being good enough. Right. And that's really at the core, if you take away all the like evidence based, you know, terminology and all that, the core is you don't feel good enough and shame creates more secrecy. So you stop talking about the people that you love and the things that you want to do and who you're going to become. And you start to pull yourself deeper into this secret space in your soul of, well, I'm not good enough yet because I can't do all these things. This is where imposter syndrome comes from, where we feel like we're not good enough, strong enough, ready to, you know, receive all this, because how dare I be an expert when I can barely keep my marriage together, I can barely date, I don't have a good sex life, whatever your, your narrative and your story is, it creates this void of secrecy within you, and you start to play really small, which then loops you into more guilt more shame like hey i'm 43 45 52 78 i should have been at this point in my life by now and i'm not and then you anchor yourself to the woulda coulda shouldas instead of who you're becoming oh goodness that's too whoa okay so we've already tackled guilt shame and imposter syndrome and we're like three minutes into this <laughs> good grief uh Talk, okay, so burnout, you know, I, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm catching everything because there's so I can't even take notes fast enough, but you're, you're talking a lot about this emotional burnout, right? Like this idea yeah. that in, in the course of either trying to create work life balance or trying to be successful or trying to do all these things that it takes to be a, a parent, a pet parent, just a functioning human on top mm -hmm. of being a functioning employee, business owner, whatever there's this cycle, it sounds like you're, where it's the guilt leads to the shame, you know, it's like all of it is just feeding into, if you've caught, if I've caught myself in that cycle, what are some of your tips to, to getting out of it? How do I, how do I change course? Yeah, that's a, a really powerful question that not everyone's ready to receive the answer to that. Um, Rich is, you know, speaking from my experience working with well over 10,000 families at this point, like I don't even count anymore. Um, that question comes up as something that people want the answer to. And then when you give it, it's so simple. 
and extremely not easy to do to really bring in and breathe into the work that you're doing in the world with yourself every single day. Coming back into that latter statement, you have to do the work with yourself. You can't say, I'm so busy building this dream, this life, this career, this business. You know, the kids have 25 activities and I barely have room to, to pee every day. Like just, I know that sounds like right TMI, but when you just think about it, like those bio breaks aren't happening for people. Like people are literally going through 12 and 16 hours of not getting up to hydrate and go to the bathroom and just do very simple things to take care of themselves because they feel like they're so busy. And part of it is because they're not slowing down enough, giving themselves permission to slow down so they can say, wait a minute, there's something missing here. Something is out of integrity, not with my lover, not with the fact that I'm not in a relationship, not with my kids who probably are quite annoying, by the way, like we love, we love the babies, but they are annoying. Like that, that's the reality, especially if they're teenagers and all that. And they can talk back to you. Mm. Even I know like I raised them. I'm a grandmom now. Like I get it. Like I'm, I'm right there with you. Love them to life. And I don't always like them. That is a whole nother conversation. But with that said, it's because we're not willing to recognize. And the first step in everything therapeutically is to recognize that there is a problem because we're doing so much of this pointing at other people and not paying attention to those three fingers that are pointing right back at ourselves. We have to look at what we've allowed. I got to take some responsibility for the fact that when I left this, you know, world of being a clinic, a clinician, a psychotherapist and medical social worker and all the different hats. And I wore many of them at the same time while I was working on my doctor degree, while I was raising a family, while I was nursing babies and all that kind of stuff. Simultaneously, I didn't take extreme ownership of the fact that I was creating some of these issues. I was creating it by not saying no. When someone said like, oh yeah, I know you like have a really full schedule, but can you help me do a fundraiser for my daughter to send her to France? I'm like, oh, I wanna send babies to France. Yeah, let me figure it out, right? Like I was packing on all these yeses and I wasn't making room for war up more of what I wanted. And part of it is because I wasn't slowing down enough to even admit what it is that I truly wanted in the first place. And that's part of the issue. So the hard part of this, to answer your question, Josh, is people have to be willing to step back, wait a minute, pause, without me needing to be in the hospital to do it, without me needing an IV in my arm and to be sick enough for me to say, oh, well, I guess I can't do anything now because, and I, right? And I can't talk and I can't breathe. You don't want your body to shut down on you, but it will mm -hmm. one way or another. There, so man, I just, I, I wish I had 10 hands to take notes and to try to double back to all the stuff. Uh, but I do want to, June was talking uh, a little bit earlier in your statement. Uh, I think it was right around when you said you have to start with a lot, you know, a lot of work you have to do on yourself. And you mentioned strengths and June was, was talking about, don't you think it takes a lot of experience to figure out your strengths? And, uh, you know, what do you think about that? What do you think about the, the idea of being able to figure out your strengths as a part of this process of admitting what you really want? Yeah, I think honestly, and this is um, to June as an expert, because I heard your introduction and all the great work that you're doing in the world, and you clearly have experience as well. There's people who want to figure it out themselves, especially strengths. It's really hard to talk about yourself, unless you're me, because I'm like, <laughs> beyond ridiculous, like not shy at all <laughs> in any way. And that took work. I didn't wake up this way. Mm -hmm. It was lots of therapy, lots of coaching, lots of advising to really fully walk into who I am now. That's how you discover your strength is you take someone that's outside of you to say, well, what do you think about this? Because if it's up to me, you know, as my former pre-therapeutized self before I went to counseling and did the work and saw the unhealed wounds and all that, that was up to that version of Nikita, who we call Kia, the younger self, she would have said, oh, I, I don't think I'm good at anything right? Like, I, I'm not really sure what my strengths are. I definitely didn't come from a family. I'm a multi-trauma survivor, very dysfunctional family. My mother's a drug addict. She's a madam. My father was in and out of prison. My grandmother and the step-grandfather that raised me had all kinds of issues, including the fact that he was a pedophile. There's a lot of not good stuff there in my background. So I didn't have people saying like, you're amazing at this. You're so beautiful. You're so awesome. You're talented. 
those weren't the affirmations that I was waking up to every day. And I know there are some people who do wake up to those very healthy families and healthy affirmations that still feel like they're not sure what their strengths are. It's because we are in our head asking ourselves the same questions and giving our same, ourselves the same answers. You have to go to someone outside of yourself. So there's things like time graph strength finders. You can take an assessment of yourself just to get a little bit of direction. You can go to a coach, an advisor, a spiritual counselor, a mentor. I called when I got really, really stuck when I was pregnant with my twins. Um, met their, my daughter's 20, her sister didn't survive. But when I was pregnant with her and I was in the middle of this transition of trying to figure out like, okay, what do I do next? I always said I was gonna go straight for my doc doctorate, but now I'm pregnant with these babies and that wasn't my plan because we already have a toddler walking around and my husband and I at the time, love him, I kept him, he's still around. I wasn't sure if we were gonna make it at that time. We were just, we were young and we were really struggling. I called an old professor, a professor that wasn't kind to me at all. He was very straight up with me and I called him because I didn't want confirmation bias. I wanted to talk to someone who wasn't going to give me the, oh, you're so great and Cherry talk me into something. I said, I would love to take you to lunch and I really want your opinion of what you saw in me as an undergraduate student because I'm trying to figure out what's the next best plan for me. Um, and we met and he basically told me straight up, he was one of my sociology professors and an undergrad, I triple major in psychology, sociology and anthropology because I'm ridiculous. Uh, and he was my sociology professor who was not very kind, red inked everything. And I said, well, you know, I'm really just confused with whether or not I should, I got into this PsyD program, and, but then I'm thinking I don't have time for five years because I got these, you know, almost three kids now and we're just trying to figure things out. And he was like, oh, Nikita, you're not a psychologist. You're the best diagnostician that I've ever met. You have such good skill, blah, 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 in all these areas, but you are hands down a holistic person. You need to go to social work. And he helped give me direction and pointed out my flaws as well as my strengths. So sometimes you just need to call out someone who isn't going to BFF you to death and is going to be honest about what they could see. I hope that was helpful, June. Was that helpful? I, I think that's a yes. I, I And, you know, honestly, as you were describing how, how to, you know, these tips to to avoiding burnout as a, and part of that is, you know, A, admitting what you really want, but B, it sounds like, you know, get the input from somebody you know is going to be honest with you to point out your blind spots. Yeah. And I think that that's, and, and also maybe where you're, where you're thriving and you don't even realize, I, I think that's great. Uh, Hope jumped in with a question while you were uh, giving all that great input. <laughs> um, she said, do you feel that social media is contributing to the problems of seeing ourselves as not, as not good enough? Oh, yes. I am a hater when it comes to social media, quite honestly, Hope. Uh, I'm a super hater. I have, my kids are 20 and almost 25, and now we have grandbabies that are two and three. I pray, I'm a woman of God, and I pray all the time that they have listened to me and their father, and they understand that their strength and their power comes from God, and everything that they allow themselves to nurture so they can create their own world and not compare themselves to the fools that are doing it for the gram, because it is a very real issue. These kids are committing suicide. They're, and, not, and I say kids, but I'm including the young adults. There are older women and men that are really frustrated that their lives don't look like, you know, whoever's, Kim's, Karen's, Becky's, Tanya's, and Tim's online when their lives don't look like that either. So yes, it absolutely is contributing. It's a huge issue for me. I'm sorry, I'll get on my soapbox. So no, do it. I, as somebody, <laughs> I mean, I work, I live and work in social media as a part of being a marketing consultant. And uh, I basically, I've almost stopped posting personally, not, not because I, I necessarily, I mean, I agree with you hundred percent, but not because of that, but main, because I do it for work. I just, yeah. it's like, oh, I'm going to post about my per but we, we, we have this tendency to post about the best parts of what's going on in our life. Like no one, all of the stuff that you married or you mentioned when you were talking about uh, recognizing burnout, those are the things we don't post about, right? Yeah. We don't post about, oh, things aren't going right in the bedroom. Things aren't going right in my relationship. Things aren't going right with my kids. Mm -hmm. I don't like my kids. Like we don't, like we might whisper those things behind closed doors, but we're always just posting the best. So I can definitely see how that contributes as well. All right, so I, okay, I'm like, there's just so much. I just wanna stop and let everyone have a cup of coffee while I process, I'm just kidding. We have to keep going. 
So let's talk about <laughs> my tea. <laughs> right. How we we if can you give me a few more steps or a few more things mm -hmm. to help recognize when I might be experiencing burnout, especially if I'm not very good at self-diagnosis? Yeah. Like, what do you see people going through? Not just that physical burnout of I haven't had a break, I haven't had a vacation, but this emotional burnout that we've been really talking about. Yeah, it's it's checking who your who you're vomiting on is one of the easiest things. Like you know, and I mean this emotionally, hopefully not physically, although that could be a thing too. But assuming that you're not physically vomiting, you know when your patience is really, really short, right? And we typically do it with the people who have proximity to us that are closest to us. So they may not necessarily be in your house. It may not be, because you might be single and live alone, right? Like, so it may not be that it's your spouse or your kids or your, your visiting cousins or whoever's coming. It could be your assistant or the vendor that you talk to the most frequently, or you notice that you're looking at the phone or, or your schedule and you're seeing clients go on your, your schedule. You should be excited about this. You've worked hard for this and you're annoyed by it. Like check in with your body. So I tell people all the time, do body scans. It is my favorite thing to do. Bring it back to your body. Do a scan from the top of your head all the way to your toes, wiggle them and do it all the way back up where you are literally checking in with your body at every single moment you can. So if you are about to get ready for a meeting and maybe it's not a meeting that you're speaking because sometimes when you have to be the speaker, your body's more tense because you're just excited. And I try not to use the word nervous although you can have both things happening, right? But they're really excited. So just a meeting that you're uh, a watcher on the wall Check in with your body. Are you tensing your back? Is there a, a knot in your belly? Are you feeling nauseous? Do you feel like you keep having to run to the bathroom, which is usually an escape? Your body wants to flight, so you find yourself doing that. Um, are you getting headaches? Are you having tension? Like really see what feels out of alignment for your body. Now here's the caveat. If you're someone who's always tense, doing a body scan is going to be really hard to tell the difference. Like, oh, was I more tense because I saw Josh's name run across my calendar or Katrina hit me up on a text message? Like, you know, just being really honest. Like if you're always tense, a body scan isn't going to be the most helpful for you unless you do things like pro progressive muscle relaxation, which we call PMR. It is a therapeutic technique that we typically do with people who have suffered from some form of trauma or very deep level anxiety but it works even if that's not your case and progressive muscle relaxation i'm just stepping back for a little bit so hopefully you guys can still see me you're doing intense tensing literally you're tensing up really hard different parts of your body you hold it for three to five seconds and then you release so you're allowing your body for the blood to rush to that point and then release so the oxygen backs up it allows you to relax physically not mentally necessarily but physically in your body. So then you can do the body scan. So to make it really simple, I would just say Google PMR or progressive muscle relaxation. So you guys can get some examples of how to do it. Cause you do want to do it body part by body part. Try to ask a question and then realize I muted myself because <laughs> I'm trying to be a good listener. All right. I saw so, you talking. <laughs> uh, um, Okay, so as I was looking through, I, I'm trying to listen and look through my notes, but mm -hmm. you know, as you're talking about recognizing, you know, burnout's happening, we have a saying in our family that poop rolls downhill. And with four kids, it's like the adult dumps on the kid, dumps yeah. on the next oldest, dumps on the next oldest. And that's easy for us to recognize because all of a sudden they're being terrible to each other and you knew, you know, it starts with you, right? Yeah. Like, was I being grumpy? I also have learned in my own life that about that three-ish, four-ish in the afternoon, I get hangry. I am not a, a pleasant person. So I've learned that I need to snack before that happens. Uh, so what you're saying though about this, you know, scanning your body, checking who you're vomiting on, those are all such great, practical, real life things you can do to check out. Am I, am I burning out in just today? Am I burning out in general? And I love that. I, I want to double back to something you said where you talked about, are you creating problems by not saying no, which could also be rephrased, I think, to are you creating problems by not saying yes to like yourself and to other things? But let's talk about that. We had somebody on Business Brew, I think it was in January, Dorothy joined us. She talked a lot about boundaries in business and it was, it was so well received. I would love to get your take on this idea yeah. of creating boundaries 
Am I, am I not, am I creating problems? Am I not saying no? How do I feel good about saying no? Yeah. Um, I look, I literally create opportunities to say no. So, and I know that sounds, uh, you know, con controversial to what you would normally think, but I love putting myself in position where people can see the expertise. You know, there's the, there's the charming effect that you have when you put yourself out there, you're uncomfortable, it's awkward, but people get to know more about who you are and then they hit you up, right? Regardless of what your business is. So this doesn't necessarily have to be a, a, a a social media visibility thing. This could just be in your circles, like in your network pods of what you're doing is making sure that you're not the person that's never talking. Raise your hand, answer a question, add value, be curious. You're not sure you have a question, create one and get people talking so they want to connect with you. Mm -hmm. And then when they actually reach out to connect, you get the opportunity to say, nope. Thank you. I love doing it all the time. I know it sounds really odd, but I do it because you want to create that space where you're send sending signals to the universe. For those of you who are very deeply connected and rooted to that reality that we're all created and we're all from the, the same. When you're doing that, you're sending signals to the universe that you're ready for more. And the more that you want is what you really have been qualified designed before you were here, like in your mother's womb to be able to handle. But you're not going to get there if you're shrinking back and being quiet all the time and too afraid to put yourself out there and be awkward and uncomfortable and fail because then your real yes that you really have been waiting for doesn't think you can handle it yet. So you do want to put yourself in that situation. And the most awkward thing to tell someone who's reaching out and saying, oh, hey, um, Robert, I would love to work with you on whatever. Can you do that? I mean, obviously you want to filter, you want to research Robert, do some professional digital stalking, right? Like you want to see if it makes sense, but if it doesn't, if it's not an alignment for you to reach, to respond to Robert, you respond by saying, Robert, thank you so much for reaching out. I am not available. Let me refer you to, because you get to be a resource always. Let me refer you to Hope. Hope is absolutely the person you want to talk to because she does X, Y, Z, and she would be amazing for that thing that you're doing. It's really hard as a business owner, especially a small business, a local business, or if you're a solopreneur to say no to a business opportunity because you're just terrified there won't be another. Yep. And I see this happen all the time, but I've learned this lesson the hard way. I know I've worked with people who've learned this lesson the hard way. If you're getting that vibe that you put it out, like you said, you've put it out in the universe that you're available and an opportunity came that just doesn't feel right, you owe it to yourself. I mean, I hear you saying you owe it to yourself to say no to that, especially yeah. if the red flags are there, right? Like yeah. what a great, oh, I just, everything so, about what you just said is so great. Josh, I wanna, I wanna make a comment here too, yeah. because you're not doing, you are not doing any favors to, to the people you're trying to help if you say yes to something you can't do, mm -hmm. right? You end up feeling bad, they end up being dissatisfied, yeah. much better off giving them helping them to somebody who is expert in what they need. So then they think of you positively as opposed to negatively. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I would also add, here's a, a very selfish view and I'm a huge believer in selfish. I literally wrote the book on it. Um, like you, it's a personal gift to yourself to create your joy, like taking care of you. Here's the thing. If you aspire to be that example we gave earlier, the mogul in the making, the secret philanthropist, and you have all these like, you know, aspirations that are tied to that. And one of your like wish list places to be on is, I don't know, what's, what's, what's one that people really love? Good Morning America, right? If that's a wish list for you and you're like, oh, I can't wait to be on Good Morning America. Like I dream for it. It would be my life would change or, or Oprah's couch or Oprah's book club, whatever it is that is your wish list. Here's the thing about constantly saying yes because of scarcity, because you're not believing that your real yes will come. So you're just saying yes to all the other things. When Oprah's uh, PR agent or Good Morning America's executive producer calls you and you've looked at your schedule and you have no bandwidth, and I don't just mean by appointment, like there's not like a slot there but you don't have energy, your mental faculties are all over the place, your skin is bad, you added all this weight from this stress, you, you feel like your libido has just been cut off, like there's nothing left to give. How powerful will you feel now that your opportunity has arisen and you are actually not ready for it?
because you've been saying all these micro yeses to all these things just so you could not have an uncomfortable conversation with saying something as simple as I am not available. Let me resource, resource you to someone else in my network. Who's suffering the most here? Those people who were receiving your yeses because of your scarcity, your limited thinking, or you and your dream to become who you really want to be? Oh my God. Micro yeses. What I I'm stealing that like outright. I Take will it. be, yeah, I will be <laughs> using that a lot. I am saying yes to <laughs> micro. Yes. Way too much. Okay. June jumped in with another uh, question and I want to make sure to get to it. She said, do you ask your clients to figure, figure out what are their duties to their state of life as a, uh, a foundation of mental health? Uh, I take that to mean wherever you are at a certain moment in your life, do you help your clients work through what are their, what are their responsibilities or their duties at that stage as a part of increasing mental health? Absolutely. So for we work with a lot of power couples and our multi our multi six figure, seven figure women entrepreneurs, we work with the ones that are fast scaling. So they're dealing with a lot of growth pains that go with that. So their narratives typically when they come to this is I'm a beast. I'm ambitious. This is what I do. I'm a high performer. And that has been the pat on the back that they've been getting from the world, whoever their world is for usually over 20 years, whether it was in their entrepreneurial hat or professional hat, whatever it is. So they're they're not looking for the pat on the back at all, but they're so accustomed to that tap that they're not sure what they would do without it. And without that tap, they're not reassured to even take vacation so they can take a picture for the gram, so they can make sure they let people know that this is something they're doing. Like these are issues that come up for a lot of them. And sitting with their mental health and wellness needs is a huge core part of what I do. You know, I'm a clinician forever. I don't serve as a, a psychotherapist anymore in my personal development company, but all those clinical so that I can give them the best of me at all times. All right, sorry, I was spacing out. I wanted, uh, Katrina shared your book link and I wanted to make sure I got it on Facebook. So I apologize for that. There's a really great conversation happening. Uh, it sounds like Katrina and June are, are really engaging. Um, I think you did a great job of getting to that. So thank you so much, Nikita, for responding to that question. I want to, uh, just as I'm you know, still scanning my notes, you said something that I've tried to key in on a lot and I actually, I think I learned it from my friend, Mr. Rowley. Uh, we get together uh, pre-COVID and then hopefully post-COVID, we'd get together for lunch every so often. And he had to, he'd ask me this question. He would say, uh, how are you doing? And I would answer, I, oh, I'm super busy. And then he'd say, yeah, but are you making any money? And I've learned to then say, I don't say I'm busy anymore. I say I'm super productive because you can be busy doing nothing. But yeah. you've talked about this idea of being busy versus productive. So as we're looking to create work-life balance, as we're trying to uh, escape burnout or avoid burnout and take care of ourselves, how do we tell the difference between busy and productive? Oh, I love this question so much. I love it so much. Thank you for, for uh, first of all, Robert, thank you for holding him with his feet to the fire to really answer the truth, you know, the true question underneath of that. Productivity is those things that allow you... And, in business, those things that allow your ship to keep moving, right? That you're not going to, to crash, not the things that just keep you floating on the, on the water, but things that really allow you to keep moving. So this is no shade, no judgment to anyone who's in a specific position right now where you can't outsource to a bunch of people and you can't delegate to a, you know, a bunch of people to help you with those non-core money-making activities that only you can do in your business. So if you happen to be a solopreneur that isn't in the specific space right now in this hour of your life, and I say that very carefully because it doesn't mean that the next hour won't offer you an opportunity to have the, the capital and the flow to be able to do that. So in this hour, if you don't have many people that you can outsource to, step back from your business and look at the things that you're doing that actually do generate the income. 
So social media is important. I'm not a fan of it, but I do understand the importance of it. We have social media presence because we do understand that people meet you wherever they meet you in your, your networking circles. They come to business group and they're like, oh, who's this great person? And then the first thing they do, if it's not go to Google, is they hit up their favorite social media platform to see if you're visible. They're using it as a way to check out your credibility. So you do want to be found in other places. However, with that said, social media in that way isn't necessarily unless you're a social media manager, a brand expert or something like that in your particular business, it's not necessarily based on your industry, the thing that people are clicking and immediately going to pay cash for your business for. If it is, you wanna put more energy into it. If it isn't, you wanna come back and say, well, how can I create something or use a tool that allows me to have a presence? Like there's things like Q, Q -U 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 dot Co, I think is the name of it. It's a free tool that you set up, you check all of the types of topics that are in alignment with your business and it automatically pulls those topics in and filters them into your social media for you. You could literally set it up one time and forget about it. And that could be something that gives you some borrowed time until you can outsource to maybe a social media expert or manager that can really help you with that. There's other tools like Smarter Q or Meet Edgar where you can put things that you already have on Evergreen so you don't have to get caught in trying to make new content every single day when you really need your hours to write those RFPs that actually allow you to be awarded th that grant money, you know, whatever your type of business is. So just being really clear, backing up from your schedule, like really auditing yourself over the last 90 days. What have I been doing that I shouldn't be doing because it's pulling me into a lot of the busy work that isn't productive with keeping the ship moving. And then to add a little insult to injury, because I like being awkward with people, is look at how much you charge. Like what's your hourly rate? So if your hourly rate, I'm just making up a random number, is $150 an hour for your services. And then you look at all the work that you've been doing over the, over the last 90 days and all the hours you spent doing something, total that up and times it by $150. Would you have paid yourself $150 an hour to do that work? Or would you have paid someone $30 an hour to do 30% of that work, right? Like really getting some perspective on that is extremely helpful. And usually that numbers part of the game, when people look at the money that they're wasting because they're, what they can do for $150 an hour in their business to keep the ship moving versus them bringing someone, for, someone in for five hours a week, two hours a week, hiring an apprentice where they're learning from you, they're learning the inside of the business, they're avoiding some mistakes because they're learning from you and you're giving them a $1,500 stipend for X number of weeks of work versus the hourly pay, like little things that you can do to really give back and allow yourself to grow, make all the difference in the world. But going to our, our previous statement earlier, you have to be willing to recognize that you're having an issue in the first place. I'm just, I'm going to be so transparent. It's shameful. Uh, and I want you to just really pick on me, Nikita. I really want you to, to just get in there. I have this tendency to do this thing where there's these busy, like this busy work mm -hmm. where I just stockpile it and I let it build up. And then I take like a four day weekend and I go to the mountain somewhere or, mm -hmm. and I take my wife and we do like a work retreat where I just work on those stockpiled non-revenue generating tasks that really I could not ever do and probably wouldn't notice, but it's things like organize my Dropbox. Yeah. Is that healthy or unhealthy? Am I, am I like just biding my time until there's a bigger problem? Like pick on me here. Yeah. So I call that pretend productivity. That's what, that's what you're doing. You're pretending to be productive in your four day weekend where you and your wife could be swinging from the trees, making love, having orgasms, being completely infused. So you could be more innovative, more creative and have ideas flow out of you literally in the middle of your orgasm. That's real talk, that's science talking right there. But instead you're pretending to be productive by having all these non core money making activity generating tasks pile up because if you were to just take that four days for just part of it for you, part of it for the, the we time, the me time mm -hmm. versus the we time, you would feel guilty 
not doing something. So you stack up all those nothings so you have something to do. That's exactly what happens. We There are times where it's like, I can't have a Saturday with all, and, and this goes back to what June was talking about. Like at this stage in life, homeowner, husband, father, it's rare that I can look at a Saturday and just yeah. go, I can do nothing today. Like, honestly, I'll wake up Sunday and go, I just wasted yesterday. So I can't be the only one. Start. So first off, thank You're you. For, thank you for turning the screw to me because that's amazing. And then second, like, can I know that's a part of creating work-life balance, but let's like, how do we create that space to not feel guilty. I, I'm, it has to go back to what you were saying yesterday, or earlier yesterday, or it felt like yesterday, <laughs> earlier when you said, admit what you want and give yourself mm -hmm. permission to slow down. Yeah, here's, here's a question that I ask my private clients. It's 11.35 my time, Eastern. I'm on the Eastern Standard Time. At this hour and whatever your time zone is, go by the space. If you were going to die at midnight tonight, there's no treatment. There's no time for any other x-rays, CT scans, blood draws, none of that. You're dying at midnight. What comes off your list? Real talk, what comes off your list, right? Like, and that's not for you to answer me, mm -hmm. right? But for yourself, like you really start to look at like, whoa, like, well, guess what? That third cousin, that favorite cousin in her third divorce party. That had I to have happened in real life. <laughs> that's oh, too listen. real. Oh my it's, gosh. You would be surprised. Um, there's all <laughs> kinds of things happening. And mind you, I celebrate the fact that you gave yourself the freedom to say no to these previous marriages because you realize that that's not what you want. So there's mm -hmm. no judgment there. Right. I also already went to the other two parties. So there's that. Um, <laughs> and I didn't get my wedding gift back. So there was that too. Uh, but no, um, in all seriousness, it's really looking at what you're doing to buy time that when you really are in the latter days of your life, because most of us are at an age just by looking at all these beautiful faces where we have a lot less time ahead of us than we have behind us, right? And being very real about that, what do you want to be said when you're you know, dead and buried? Oh, he was great, he worked so much, he gave so much to the world, but your kids are like, yeah, but I never knew him. <laughs> He was never really around for me because he was always working for those other people. And this is a real thing that happened with me. One of my come to Jesus moments was when my daughter, who's just turned 20, was, I don't know how old she was because she gets on my nerve. Uh, she was somewhere between seven and nine years old. She's literally me times 10. So imagine that, which is which is why I said that. We were sitting at, tape, at the dinner table, my husband, uh, my oldest son, we were all sitting having spaghetti or whatever we were eating. And my daughter had a moment where she was bossing up. She said, uh, mom, I think you're awesome. And I said, oh, well, thank you, darling. That's so sweet of you. She was like, yeah, you're awesome for everyone else except for me. Well, I'm a black mama, first of all. So there's like some lines on, on how we're gonna have this conversation. There was also the pride in me that she was advocating for herself because I've taught both my kids to advocate, to communicate, to share how they're feeling. They're entitled to feel it. There's also a way to share those mm -hmm. feelings, right? So um, I immediately got completely defensive. I was like, what do you mean? Do you know how much I do for you, right? Because I'm going down my head in my mind of like, we got jazz, tap, hip hop, soccer, right? Like I'm going in my head of like, oh, the crap that I take you to, you little ungrateful. Like I didn't say these out loud, but in my head, those 15.2 milliseconds, it was all like, what do you mean? I don't do this for you. And I was like, Messiah, my daughter, I do a lot for you. What do you mean? She was like, yeah, you do a lot for me. We sit in the car. We have a 45 minute drive because she's very precocious back and forth to school every single day because we lived out of county 45 minutes each way to drive her into the city to school. She's like, you're on the phone. You're not talking to me. When you come to dance class, you're not with the other moms actually paying attention. You're on your laptop doing your work. And she was right. I did all the things. I had a full agenda for her. So I wouldn't give her the life that I didn't have, but I was in a twilight zone moment, really being a healthier, perverse version of my parents who weren't there for me, who abandoned me physically, but I was giving her that same emotional connection to not feeling fully loved with me not being fully present in her life. And I had to take ownership of that. And I really had to step back and look at all the stuff that my husband and I were slaving three, four, five jobs at a time to make sure that they could have. 
And they were like, yeah, but I, I really just want you. Okay, I got a doozy. This is I, this probably will be the worst question I ask because of how I'm hyping it. But how do I get to that place that we've been talking about? Everything we've been talking about is like getting to that place. Mm -hmm. there, there's no busy work. I'm saying no to the right things. I'm creating space. I have work-life balance. How do I get there? Because I hear the yeah buts. Like I live in this yeah. world where I deal with a lot of yeah but people. Yeah. I'm not making any money yet. How do I get there? Yeah, this is harder, right? So if you're in a if you're in a position where you feel like your schedule is really full because it has to be, because you don't see any windows of escape, you really feel like, you know, I have three, four, five jobs, whether that's physically or just kind of proverbially within the context of what you're doing within your business in order to just keep the boat afloat. Mm -hmm. So there's my yeah, but Nikita, all this is. So how do, how do I get to another space? I hear it all the time too. Like, how do I do it? My first thought, in addition to recognizing that you have a problem and being admit, being able to admit it, is now looking at how is this life that you have right now in this second, not who you're becoming, but how you have it right now, how is it serving you? Because it's serving some part of you. So I had one of my coaches ask me this a similar question, I don't know, however long ago. Um, I was, I'm, an, I'm a giver, like I love giving, 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 giving is my thing. And I want to be able to resource you and point you in the right direction, even if I can't serve you. So if I gave you a no to my time, I want to still resource you. I have a really nice deep network where I can connect just about anybody to someone that can help them get a little bit closer to wherever they want to be. And I found myself doing that so much, but overextending that time that I was starting to resent it a little bit. So my coach asked me the question that I'm going to ask everyone here who's listening on Facebook and in the Zoom room, if you are doing anything like that, that you feel like is draining you, it's pulling from your energy management, you're all over the place in your spirit emotionally, you are exhausted and you just, you're tired is tired. If you're tired is tired, I have to ask you, who is that serving? And I'm not saying who else in your, in your world, in your house, who in you is it serving? So when I got asked this question, because I've done so much work and had so much therapy, when the question came, I was able to pull it up immediately. Oh, the nine-year-old little girl in me that was abandoned by her mother, that's who is serving. I realized that I'm trying to fix my mother to make sure that these people, these power partners, subject matter experts, people that are coming into my world, always feel like I was able to contribute when my mother chose to leave me with a pedophile, knowing what happened because he was her pedophile as well. When she chose to leave the house and leave me there, knowing that there were other options, she felt in my mind as a nine-year-old, like I wasn't good enough to keep, that I was a burden, that I was taxing, that I wasn't offering her anything of value. So what do I do in my twenties and my thirties and my forties and beyond? I wanna make sure that everyone knows that I'm here to serve some kind of way. And so how was that serving me to have this crazy wild experience as an adult who's married and has degrees and all the things? My nine-year-old was still being served. And I don't need to shame my nine-year-old or tell her she's bad. I need to heal her and talk to her and let her know it's okay. You're safe now. You're amazing. You have a lot more growing to do and peace. You no longer have to prove yourself to anyone. You didn't have to prove yourself to her either. And you have to be willing to have that conversation with yourself because that's really the only thing that's gonna bring you to that space of, of clarity. All the tactics that I could give you, those are things that you'll get to as part of the process. But the thing that'll keep coming up is if you're being served, it's like, I love chocolate, so I'm gonna eat it even though I know it's adding pounds to my hip. So if you tell me, oh, but you want to lose the weight, stop eating the chocolate. I'm like, yeah, but the chocolate is comforting to me. It's still serving me. I'm not going to put it down until I found some other way to comfort myself, right? So it's the very same thing. And you could give me all kinds of like, go do, what, what's the new thing, keto and, you know, all the, like you could tell me all the things to do, but at the end of the day, I'm going to do keto real strong for three weeks and I'm going to be right back at that chocolate because the yeah. chocolate is still serving me until I recognize that I'm getting something out of the chocolate. So you do have to have that conversation with yourself. You said, when I asked you the question about 
how do you shift course when you're getting burned out? You, you said, I'm going to give you the simplest answer and it's the hardest thing. And you said, it's, you have to work on yourself and you have to admit what you really want. And it sounds like for all of us, it, we, there's going to have to be some acknowledgement of the trauma or things that have led us to the burnout or led us to poor work-life balance underneath all of it. And it may not be the, I mean, Nikita first, I mean, thank you so much for sharing and just being so transparent with us. I just can't even imagine, but it sounds like we, we're all gonna have to identify what trauma it is, whatever level we all had something yeah. that's led us to whatever you know, unhealthy behaviors creating burnout or creating a poor work-life balance. Um, so I, I assume you're just probably the biggest advocate for counseling or therapy or whatever it is, a like coaching, which I just, business coaching is like therapy in disguise. If you haven't done it, you're going to end up, it's, it's therapy in disguise to, yeah. like, you know, I think, and it's great. Um, and I know there are some head nods. I know there are some of my personal friends on today that are big advocates for counseling too. So can you talk a little bit about that? Like counseling as an, as a, as a part of our, our therapy as a part of, you know, creating work-life balance and avoiding burnout? Yeah, it's you creating your own table of support, right? So you have to look at like, who's your support for someone else, Some, someone, and, you know, as a father, you're supporting your children. There's some part of you that's an advisor or co-advisor for your, your forever love, your wife. Um, Mark, you're supporting someone, right? June's supporting one, Annie's supporting one. You're mm -hmm. always, most of us here are supporters of other people all the time. But who is really at your table? And for some, for a moment, it may not be a forever thing, but there may be a time in your life where you need to pull up a chair for an actual therapist that's going to be part of that process. I'm a balance and relationship advisor. That's the moniker that I use so I can use my clinical and my coaching and all my, my tools that way. But I still refer many of our clients for therapy in addition. I could do it, but I want to be really clear that I'm not going to do therapy in the way that I would if I was only your therapist versus when I'm your balance and relationship advisor. I'm just going to use some tools to help you get to those darker places and create a sacred space that's, you know, healthy and vulnerable enough for you to be able to do the work. And I might still need to bring in a therapist with you too. So now that person has me and someone else at their table. But who else? Like, who's your spiritual advisor? You need you need someone at your table for when you're you're fussing at whoever your God is. I fuss at God all the time. Like, oh my gosh, I yell at God all the time. Yes. Like I am, and then when I know I've behaved badly, I'll say, "Oh, Jesus and I are talking about that." When I get there, all the time. Oh, I love hearing you say that. All and the I time. love the idea. It, it doesn't whoever your God is. I love that. I mean, that mm -hmm. spiritual side we can't ignore. Oh my gosh, you cannot ignore it. There's something greater than you. You know, that's, that's where we remove the ego a little bit. Like there is something greater than you and whatever that is, that's pulling, that's confirming that you're in resistance with constantly just honoring like who's at the chair for you at your table. That's helping you just have honest conversations. You know, that could be like one of my best friends since 13 is an intercessor as well as am I. I can't intercess on my own behalf. I have to go to someone else. I can empower an ant to move a mountain, but I can't empower myself all the time. So I need someone at the table that can help me do that. I have coaches and mentors to do that. I have a business incubator that I belong to for the tactical stuff of, you know, the nitty gritty tools, the cues and smarter cues and all that stuff of the business. Like you need to be able to have some, a table of advisors, your trusted advisory for yourself. And I know that that's hard if you have trust issues. I know that it's extra hard if you are limited in capital in that moment. It only takes one to get you started. And the one is you admitting that you need something outside of yourself. So there's networking circles and round tables that you can come to. There's business brew that you can show up and get other perspectives from. Like it really does start here. Now you can't expect to get your therapy from the business brew, right? Like you might have had a therapeutic moment and some ahas and some breakthroughs. Hallelujah. Thank you. That's awesome. And it's going to dissipate as soon as you get off of here and you have five more phone calls to make, right? But you need that accountability from other people at your table that you meet with regularly. And those people don't have to live at your table for 10 years. Reposition people. You might say, well, I already have some of those people. Mm -hmm. And how is it serving you? 
how much are they giving or are they just taking up space? You have to be on. I reposition people all the time. I tell my husband, don't play. You'll get repositioned now. I don't, I don't care that it's been all these years. You will be repositioned. You better make sure this is reciprocal all the time, all the time. And that means I have to do the work as well. Oh my God. My, my head hurts from nodding in agreement. My face hurts from laughing. You're so amazing. Okay. So I know you've got another commitment and you were so gracious to give us your time. So I want to make sure we have enough time for last minute questions. So if yeah. you have them, send them in. Uh, whether it's on Facebook or here in Zoom, I do want to get back to a question that uh, Katrina asked, mm -hmm. and I've got to find it. So she asked such a really great question because I know it touches on some of the other parts of your business and what you do, which is how do two powerful personas learn to mesh their lives when they've been solo for a long time? How do you create? And I know it's a little off topic, but I think there is that dynamic where some of us might come into that significant relationship later in life. So we've been a, a business leader, a, a solopreneur, whatever. And now there's two of us. How yeah. do we, how do we marry that literally figuratively? You know, how do we do that? And it, it, that's a great question, Katrina. Thank you. And it is absolutely related to everything we're talking about with the balance and the boundaries and making sure you're in a partnership with someone that's going to help you get to who you want to become and you don't get lost in their dream because that can happen really easy if you have a more dominant like you're both very alpha but one is like more dominant in their expression it's very easy to get lost in that so you have to date people all i don't care who you are how old you are how many marriages business and or you know literal that you had you know you have to date you have to date in all your partnerships so even if on paper you've already signed operating agreements and all the things and you're in it you can still date the same way 26 plus years later, my husband and I still date. You want to date your partner because they're evolving and changing along the way. You both might have come into the business with one kind of idea of where you're going. And because they've experienced some life, because life is happening to all of us all the time, they've experienced some life that might have made them reevaluate what they truly want to do in this business, you have to have that ongoing communication and it doesn't have to be an argument every time. When you go on a date and you create an aesthetic environment that feels good and comfortable, you're less likely to like bite each other's heads off. So you wanna have those moments with your business partner where you set up some dating time, 60, 90 minutes every couple of weeks where it's just, let me reconnect to who you are what's going on in your life. So if you might have like 30 minutes of business agenda kind of stored in there, but you really don't want to lose who the person is. If you were friends before the business and you found yourself falling out of that and you're like, if we didn't have this business, we wouldn't be friends, there's a problem. That means that all of your conversations have just become so agenda focused that there's no love there anymore. There's no intimacy. That's not okay. If you were business partners that became friends and now you feel like you've crossed so many boundaries and everything's all torn around, you got to look at, well, how far did that intimacy go, right? And I'm not even talking about physical intimacy. I'm talking about social intimacy, intellectual intimacy, crisis intimacy, work intimacy. Like there's so many levels, subtypes, if you will, to intimacy. And intimacy in and of itself really quickly is just deeper connection. It's just deeper connection. That's all it is, especially when you're in business, you're having a deeper connection where you're now more aware of the other person's needs. That doesn't mean that you lose yourself in the process, but now you're aware. So if we were to have a bedroom conversation for you to have really good lovemaking, you have to be aware of what your partner likes, which means you're listening to how they're moving, how they're breathing, what they're responding to. It's the same way, literally, in a business relationship, you're paying attention, you're actively listening. Is it what they're saying and the way they're saying it? Or is it also how they're responding with inaction? How long are they taking to respond to your emails? How short are they on the phone with you? When you say, well, I want to have a conversation. Or I want to be a part of that meeting too. Are they like, Ugh, fine. You know, like, are they giving you energy to make you feel like they don't want you there? There's something wrong. And you need to have those ongoing conversations to create the dating. So you always have deeper intimacy with them. I hope that was helpful in such like a short moment. Oh, all right. Well, I found it valuable. Hopefully it helped answer Katrina's uh, question as well. I, I cannot thank you enough, Nikita, for joining us. One, on just such short notice, we just chatted last week for the first time. 
the, the turnaround was amazing. You have truly blessed uh, this whole group with your insight and wisdom. I want to be super mindful of your time. So I'm going to let you go. If there's any last second questions, get them in. Otherwise, just a big round of applause for Nikita. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming. Oh my God. I gosh. appreciate you guys, truly. So amazing. As always, we'll have this available as a video. It'll go up on YouTube. Uh, I, I don't want to tease this too much, but I am in the process of going through the, the COVID backlog since we've started recording these and trying to turn them into a podcast. Yours will be last. I'm just trying to go through chronological, but eventually this will be a podcast as well. So lots of opportunities to repurpose this. Uh, it's going to be available. I found this super helpful. Thank you so much. Any last parting wisdom nuggets that you have on top of everything that you've already given us? Yeah, um, I would just add to look at your schedule and look at a space where you can give yourself permission to pause. Where can you give that? 20 minutes, two minutes, 90 minutes, where it's really not about pretend productivity and stuffing your, your time with other things, but you could literally wiggle your toes and sip some wine or water and whatever and just body scan and be who you are and check in. Like, look at your schedule to make that time for yourself to be a little bit more selfish you will be blessed because of it. Awesome, thank you so much. You're so great. And on that, you've also touched on some topics that we have never had come up at a business brew, which is amazing. I think it's great um, so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you everybody for making time this morning. We will be back in May. Uh, I also, if you're, you're on, I sent out a survey. It's on all my social media sites. It also went out in our newsletter. We'd love to hear from you on what you want from Business Brew. So take like two minutes, fill out this quick survey, give me the feedback so that I can make uh, the, the adjustments and bring on the guests that you want to hear from on the subjects you want to hear from. And on that note, Nikita, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for making time. And all of you have a great rest of your day as well. Thank you so Thank you. much.